you don't already have this in your notes from past studies, number one is what is called formal equivalence. Formal equivalence. And that's simply a theological translation term that means word for word. When people are translating the Bible and looking at the original manuscripts, they try to translate word for word. And many that would be listening to me would say, well, that's the only way that people should interpret the Bible. And anybody that's not interpreting the Bible that way is, is, is corrupted. Well, let me give you an example of why what you're saying is unlearned. Let me just use a phrase in modern English. Sometimes the secular world, I think, I might be wrong, but I think this dates back to early theater. But uh, they believe saying good luck was bad luck. And so a phrase was used that uh, has become popular, is still around today in the English culture, English language, break a leg. And uh, that would be said instead of good luck because their IQ was so low they thought saying good luck meant bad luck. I mean, it, there's, there's no way of explaining that other than ignorance. And so somebody invented the colloquialism, break a leg. So what you have to understand in translation is these types of colloquialisms are not just in the English language, they're in all languages, including Hebrew, including Greek, including Aramaic. There are certain phrases that are used that if you translated them literally, you would not have an accurate interpretation, you would have a colloquialism, a colloquialism that does not translate to a modern reader. So if we were translating from a passage in the Bible where they said break the leg in the original manuscripts in Hebrew meaning good luck, translators would not translate that as break your leg or have somebody break your leg. They would say, you know, good luck or good fortune or may favor, etc. So just a quick insight, and, and that's a deep subject for me to give you one single illustration. But people who say, anybody who doesn't interpret the Bible from formal equivalence and word-by-word -word focus in their process of interpretation is corrupting the scripture. Again, you're dealing with individuals who are making comments on a level uh, of subject matter they're not qualified to speak. I hope that's clear. So translators have the difficult assignment of looking at original text. Those that do word-by-word -word sometimes do not do us a favor in translation because their unbending dedication to word-by-word -word translation should be looked at from the full context and sometimes the full narrative because we don't communicate word by word, we communicate expressing thoughts using words to express thoughts. I'll not get deep into that because I don't want to bore you. So formal equivalence, if you're taking notes, write that down. Here's how Bibles are translated. Teams are put together and a decision is made and some teams decide. And it's usually teams of hundreds of people, dedicated scholars, uh, and they carefully and meticulously go over original manuscripts to give us the most accurate translation in our language that would match the language that they're translating from. Word by word is called formal equivalence. The second is dynamic equivalence. And those would be teams of translators who are translating a Bible and their thought is we want to be as accurate to word by word, formal equivalence, as is possible for us with these manuscripts, but we understand that because of languages changing, even in the English language, there are some words in our language today that 50 years ago, 100 years ago, had totally different meanings. So dynamic equivalence, thought by thought, they go into the study with the same standard, as much as is possible, Let's be word for word accurate, but let's be willing to take a step back and look at the entire thought that the Apostle Paul or Jesus or Moses or whatever Bible passage they're translating, what did the original author really mean to say and translate that as accurately as possible. That's what dynamic equivalence is or thought for thought. And the third way that they translate, oftentimes considered the lesser of the three as far as accuracy goes, is paraphrase. 
So when you see a Bible and it says paraphrase, it doesn't mean that it's corrupted, but it probably is not going to have the higher standards of accuracy of formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence. With that said, let's close by going over the five most accurate translations of the Bible. Number one, the New American Standard Bible, oftentimes called the NASB. New American Standard of the Bible. The NASB is a Bible that stays as close as possible to the literal reading of the original text. It would be considered formal equivalence. That's why I took the time to teach you those three methods that translators use. Uh, formal equivalence, word by word. Dynamic equivalence, thought by thought. Paraphrase, uh, a little looser use of, of defining and adding to uh, and conveying passages. But the NSAB is a formal equivalence, word by word translation with a focus of staying as close to the literal text as was absolutely possible. Uh, at the same time, they wanted to preserve the literary structure and uh, as with all translations, they also wanted it to be readable. Because the wrestling match in translation is if your formal equivalent translation of being word for word is so strict and unbending, you can get uh, statements that are accurate, but at the same time, at the expense of being readable to the individual who's trying to read and study the scripture. The NSAB, is often at the front of the list with serious Bible students. I'll just tell you that right up front. In many Bible colleges, in many seminaries, uh, many scholars, many professors, many PhDs, in whatever uh, their particular uh, branch of study might be in theology, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, is at the top of the list of considered to be perhaps the most accurate Bible available to us today. Many Bible translators will concede, however, that the NASB, uh, though it holds the title by most as the most accurate modern Bible available to us today, uh, those same individuals will say that it is not the most readable Bible available today. It was originally published in 1963 it was revised in 1995, and uh, one of the things that makes it so accurate was that they used and had available to them uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't have time to teach on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but if you've heard me in the past, you're aware of the fact that the Dead Sea Scrolls are the most accurate manuscripts available for the Old Testament and were only discovered in modern history. Uh, they are considered, they, the Dead Sea Scrolls are considered to be the best manuscripts available for the Old Testament. And for example, because they were uh, discovered uh, in recent years, uh, the scholars and the team of 47 that put together the King James Version of the Bible, which I love, uh, they had no access to that. It wasn't discovered until quite some time later. And so for that reason, because the NSAB scholars uh, had access to the Dead Sea Scrolls and put such a, a firm emphasis upon the focus of interpreting from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it is the reason why many scholars consider the New American Standard Bible as the most accurate scholarly Bible available today. But again, it does not hold the title as the most readable. Now, as I list these, <clears throat> I'm not putting a real emphasis upon, uh, as I go down through this list, you know, number one's the best, number five's the worst. That's not what this is about. I did put NSAB up front and told you that it is considered as the most accurate Bible available uh, to us today. But as we go down through this list, just remember, uh, this list does not degrade. As I go down, I'm not saying that number two is less than one, number three is less than two, and so forth. These are all highly recommended Bibles, and I get that question all the time from people who are coming back to Christ and finding Christ through the ministry of Lost Lamb Association. You know, it's one of the most common questions that I hear. I'm a brand new Christian. I don't own a Bible. 
what would you recommend? We get that question here all the time. Number two, the King James Version of the Bible, uh, which is what I grew up on uh, from my childhood into this day. I love, honor, and appreciate the King James Version. Now, in reading the comments, because our videos have millions and millions of views, there are some people who listen only in part uh, to some of the things that I've taught in the past, and they have taken some uh, statements out of context and feel that I'm a critic of the King James Version of the Bible. This study proves that they have not thought it through or have, have not listened from beginning to end because I am listing it as one of the most accurate translations of the Bible that you can trust and read and own. I love the King James Version of the Bible, but I have multiple critics uh, in the comments on our channel uh, that compare me to the Antichrist because I would dare to say that because the King James Version was written in 1611 and didn't have access to all of the manuscripts that are available today, that I'm trying to rip the King James Version out of history and out of the Christian church and, and uh, I must be possessed by the same spirit as the Antichrist. And I'm usually not bothered uh, by people who, who criticize me with IQs above. Uh, well, Lord, I apologize. I ask you to forgive me for what I was about to say and thank you that I didn't say it. But uh, I'll just leave that alone. Let me give you a, another example uh, when the King James Version of the Bible was written, and this is to help you understand, I'm not criticizing it, but if you wonder why there is criticism against the King James Version by some scholars, the main thing is this. They only had 47 scholars, and quite frankly, they weren't all scholars. King James uh, appointed 47 men. Some of them were scholars. Many of them were clergymen. But they only had a small team, and by the standards of translation, like for example, a modern Bible, there might be 50 people assigned to just interpreting one single book of the Bible. Uh, for example, uh, somebody might be uh, assigned to interpret uh, the book of Hebrews, and they may assign a large number of New Testament scholars. You would have to, first of all, be a New Testament scholar. You'd have to be a Greek scholar. And they assign entire teams in a modern Bible just for one book. The King James Version only had 47 on the entire team of interpreting the Bible. They did not have completed manuscripts like we have today. And some were scholars. Some were simply respected clergy. They did a phenomenal job for what they had. This is not my criticism. I'm just telling you this is a criticism that exists in the world of academia concerning the King James Version of the Bible. Perhaps the second greatest criticism, again, not me. I love it. I read it. I own it. I grew up on it. I've memorized, I think, close to 2,000 verses out of it. But many who are critical of the King James Version would also point out that in the original manuscripts, uh, the name Jehovah was mentioned over uh, close to 8,000 times. The name of God in original manuscript mentioned almost 8,000 times. For whatever reason, the King James Version translators of the Bible only included it in the King James Bible seven times. So I'm just teaching you. You're going to hear this criticism uh, if you talk to individuals that uh, perhaps prefer another modern version, you'll hear these criticisms against the King James Version. Does that discount, listen, does that discount the King James Version from being uh, an accurate, readable, precious Bible? Absolutely not. I am including it today. So anyone who would level criticism before you go into the comments and uh, you attack me for trying to make uh, comments of ripping the King James Bible out of the modern church. Uh, remember what the title of the video is. The five most accurate versions of the Bible that I personally recommend to Christians, new believers, and all of our students. But I love you enough. I want to teach you. You should be able to understand why some people level such criticisms. One could argue that the King James Version of the Bible is the most important book in the entire English language. It actually shaped and fashioned the English language for hundreds of years. Only eternity 
will reveal the countless numbers of people who have been converted, discipled, and secured their entire lives using nothing but the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version of the Bible, I am going to include in that list the New King James Version of the Bible because they are almost identical other than, as you know, the 1611 version of the King James Version of the Bible was written in Elizabethan English, and many people find that language to be archaic, difficult to read. Many find it as a hurdle for brand new believers who are sadly in our country, grew up in an educational system where upon graduation, some of our, our students, in fact, in this country, uh, the last data I saw was over 23% of our students graduating from high school in America are functionally illiterate. Now, that's not totally illiterate, functionally illiterate. They have a difficult time reading, writing, and understanding basic English. And any teacher that's listening to me knows that's, that, that's not an exaggeration. So as believers, as ministry leaders, as the founder of Lost Lamb Association, uh, currently the president of North Point Bible College and Seminary, my approach to a new believer is I want to put an accurate version of the Bible in their hands that they can both read and understand. And so I highly recommend the New King James Version if you're a person listening to me and you find the Elizabethan English of the King James Version a hurdle to your understanding, consider the New King James Version. It's almost identical, other than a lot of the archaic language has been translated to be made more readable. One of the things that I also want to point out to you, as a matter of fact, uh, I brought it with me today. I hold it in my hands. I grew up on the King James Version of the Bible. The Bible that I hold in my hands, and if I were to hold it upright, uh, it would probably fall apart. But if, if I went through this with you, you would see that it is... Uh, well-marked, well-read, and worn out. Uh, to my memory, this is the first quality Bible that I was given uh, by my parents as a young boy. And uh, it's all worn out now, but you would see uh, that it's a Schofield. And it's a Schofield King James Version of the Bible. I love this Bible. Uh, this would be a Bible if the Lord tarries and I pass away, just as I fought to find one of my dad's precious Bibles. I would hope one of my two children or grandchildren would, would fight for uh, grandpa's first quality Bible. Uh, I think it was my dad in particular, uh, but knowing my dad, my mom probably did the shopping and picked it out. Uh, even my name still holds up on it. I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but you know, Tiff Shuttlesworth. My parents presented me with this King James Schofield Bible, leather bound, I treasured it as a child. I treasure it now, as you can see, even though I took that all through Bible college. That's what I used through all of my years in Bible college. And God knows how many times I've read and wept and prayed uh, through the pages of this Bible. It is precious uh, to my heart. So I, I love the King James Version, but I also love uh, my followers and students enough that if you find, I did find by me, but if you find the Elizabethan English a little too archaic or difficult, try the New King James uh, Version. It's almost identical, just a little more readable. Number three on the list is the English Standard Version, uh, the ESV. The ESV is actually very similar to the NASB because it also has a literal uh, formal equivalence translation. But they did a better job, as was their focus. They wanted to have the accuracy of the New American Standard Bible, but the, the committees, they wanted to address the readability uh, factor that the NSAB was being accused of being so strict to word by word that they had produced an accurate Bible that was not necessarily the most readable Bible. So the ESV is very similar to the NASB, except the translators did a great job in trying to make it a little more readable. It was originally published in 2001. A new edition was uh, published in 2009. And in many circles of Christian academia, the ESV uh, has replaced the NASB for many who prefer uh, a Bible that is dynamic, or excuse me, formal equivalence, word by word, but with the readability 
of a dynamic. And the ESV is actually a revision of the RSV. I actually had a question uh, come in. Someone asked me, I have a, a Bible that has RSV on it. Well, the ESV is just a revision of the RSV. And if you're trying to decide between the two, the ESV is newer and uh, many would consider better. It's written in a very modern English, yet uh, many readers find that it reminds them, uh, which some of you would like. Many people think that the reading of the ESV uh, has the flow and poetry of the King James Version of the Bible. It is modern, but it has uh, high standards of being pure and faithful in gendered language found in original texts and some of the older translations. Number four, the New International Version, or the NIV. The NIV is a dynamic translation. Again, dynamic means thought for thought. Formal equivalence means word for word. The NIV is a dynamic translation. The NIV translator's concern was communicating the meaning in a way that was readable in English even if it meant a slight departure from original wording. The NIV was the second Bible that I added to my collection uh, when I went to Bible college. I only had, matter of fact, I'm going to finish out the study uh, with this old faithful in my hands. It uh, actually feels good, uh, not to mention it's about 27 pounds lighter than the one I typically hold. But uh, the second Bible that I owned as uh, a first-year student in Bible college was I purchased uh, an NIV Bible. And I found it to be very readable after a lifetime of reading 18th century Elizabethan uh, English, which I love its flow and poetry, but I remember getting an NIV and I felt like uh, I, I got saved all over again and had a Bible for the very first time. Because the NIV was actually designed to be easy to read, easy to understand, especially, listen carefully, because this perhaps is one of the most significant things about the NIV in its translation that I would want you to know. They put a strong emphasis upon international readability. What do I mean by that? There are a lot of people who live in America who read, write, speak English, but it's not their first language. And they may grow up in a home. My son-in-law my son-in-law grew up in a home where English was not the first language spoken in his home. Italian was. But he reads, writes, studies English as well or better than I do. He attended uh, the Bible college that I'm currently president of where he met my daughter who also attended. And he was a, a great student and still is very scholarly. But English would not be considered his first language. Uh, it may be now, growing up, his parents would have probably told him it was not. The NIV was written with the thought of an international audience. People who read, write, and speak English, but it was not their first language. Let's make sure we produce an accurate translation of the Bible, but it has a readability even for international audiences. And so that was kind of the meaning behind the NIV. <coughs> Đúng rồi, chỗ này nhân 2, chỗ này nhân 3 Như vậy 2 cộng 3 đó là 5 bi trên 6 Đây chính là pha dao động tại thời điểm 1 phần 30 giây đó là 5 bi trên 6 Đó là xong cái nội dung của cái bài số 3 Bài số 2 Bài số 3 Bít tông của một động cơ đốt trong dao động Trên một đoạn thẳng dài 16cm Như vậy các bạn nhìn chú ý nè Đây là vị trí cân bằng ô của nó Bít tông này sẽ dao động trên cái đoạn dài 16cm Tức là từ đây đến vị trí này Đúng không ạ? Nguyên cái vị trí này của các bạn là 2A nè Đây là vị trí cân bằng Từ đấy đến đây là 1A Từ đấy đến đây cũng là 1A nữa Như vậy 16cm này chính bằng 2A Đúng chưa ạ? Bằng 2A Các bạn lưu ý Tức là người ta cho quý đạo dao động Thì chúng ta suy ra được Đúng không ạ? Người ta cho quý đạo dao động hay là đoạn thẳng dao động là bao nhiêu? Chúng ta sẽ suy ra được biên độ lấy quý đạo chia cho hai Được chưa? Rồi người ta yêu cầu mình xác định biên độ dao động của một điểm trên cái tông Như vậy biên độ A đúng không? Sẽ bằng là 16 chia 2 thì bằng 8cm Quá dễ Đúng không? Mấy bài này rất là dễ các bạn Giống như bài cưới ngựa xem hoa thôi chứ không có gì cả rồi, bây giờ chúng ta qua bài số 4. Phương trình dao động 
điều hòa là x bằng 5 cos 2 bt cộng bi trên 3 hãy cho biết biên độ pha ban đầu và pha tại thời điểm t của dao động là bao nhiêu như vậy bây giờ bài này người ta cho biết đây là chính là bài số 1.8 trong sách bài tập của chương trình sách vật lý giáo khoa kết nối tri thức À, sách bài tập à, kết nối tri thức của vật lý lớp 11 đó các bạn Các bạn có sách bài tập, sách bài tập người ta ra rất là hay Các bạn mua về các bạn tham